Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, if you were sitting back watching Virtual Legality, following the channel and thinking, you know, Rick just hasn't covered enough administrative procedure questions. And what's this Chevron deference I've been hearing about all these times lately? Well, then you're probably in law school or you're a practicing lawyer. But either way, you've got some good luck because we're going to dive into that question today, talking about deference between the various branches of the U.S. government and what Justice Clarence Thomas wound up saying about that deference that got a number of articles written about it this week. So I've pulled up an article from Ars Technica, which is one of those places that I follow on a regular basis. And it says, Clarence Thomas regrets ruling that Agent Pi used to kill net neutrality. Okay, that sounds like a headline item, right? That somehow Clarence Thomas has expressed concern over a ruling that he made that allowed net neutrality to die. And of course, we cut Ars Technica and the rest of the websites of the world a little bit of slack. They're trying to get clicks. They know what their audience wants. They know why they're visiting Ars Technica. But I wanted to make this video because it popped up into my feed. I thought it was very interesting. I think the article does a better job than the headline of kind of describing what this is about. But also that what this is all about is much, much more broad than just net neutrality. It actually touches on virtually every aspect of what United States citizens regularly engage with with the U.S. government. And as I've titled this video, what my subscribers and viewers have indicated they are specifically interested in, in terms of what I'm talking about, which is COPPA and the Federal Trade Commission and how it is interpreting COPPA to apply to YouTube website operators, channel runners, right, in a way that I think is personally unjustified by the language of the statute, but which under certain United States precedent that we are about to talk about should be given deference by the court system, by the judicial branch. And that's one of the things that Clarence Thomas objects to. So while Ars Technica frames this as something that Justice Thomas is particularly concerned about with respect to net neutrality, what he's actually concerned about, and like all things in virtual legality, we're going to look at the source, is the deference that the judicial branch gives to the executive branch. And that's going to have us talking a lot about how the United States government is organized, but in particular, how these agencies can reinterpret previous interpretations that they've had of their own kind of authorizing statutes and how courts are essentially obliged to allow for that, for the agency to change its mind. And as you know, if you've been following United States politics, if you've been following various presidential administrations, then you know that because so many of these agencies have all of their authority vested in the executive branch, that hirings and firings and general ordinary tumult amongst the employees of these agencies means that they change their mind all the time, right? Agencies, entities, institutions, they don't have their own minds. They have the minds of the employees that run them. And when you have that changeover, when you change between parties at the presidential level, you change the heads of various agencies, you get different interpretations. So while this headline is correct, insofar as it did, quote unquote, allow or that Agent Pi used to quote unquote, kill net neutrality, that's accurate in a sense. It's also a very narrow reading of what Clarence Thomas was talking about. So let's dive into this because I find it supremely interesting. And if you do too, then hopefully we can have a little bit of an illuminating and educational talk about it. It says, hey, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wants a do-over on his 2005 decision in a case that had a major impact on the power of federal agencies and regulation of the broadband industry regulation of every industry, everything that a federal agency touches, this specific decision and an earlier decision called Chevron touches on itself. It says in National Cable and Telecommunications Association versus Brand X Internet Services, better known as Brand X because the former is a mouthful, Thomas wrote the 6-3 majority opinion that upheld a Federal Communications Commission decision to classify cable broadband as an information service. But in a dissent on a new case released Monday, Thomas wrote that he got Brand X wrong. Thomas regrets that Brand X gave federal agencies extensive power to interpret U.S. law, a power generally reserved for judges. That is wildly too broad of a reading. Or more specifically, it's wildly too broad of a reading of what U.S. law has generally reserved for judges. Chevron is not that young. I was taught it in my law school. It had been taught for decades before I got to law school. And so for a long, long time, there has been a general deference of the judicial branch to the interpretation of statutes by the executive branch agencies. 
But Thomas said on Monday, regrettably, Brand X has taken this court to the precipice of administrative absolutism. In other words, that the executive would have total and plenary authority to do whatever it likes. Under its rule of deference, agencies are free to invent new purported interpretations of statutes and then require courts to reject their own prior interpretations. Purported there being in parenthetical, but to imply that Justice Thomas thinks that some of these new justifications are essentially lies because the court can't read people's minds. And once you have a test that allows for deference to any kind of rational basis that one might have to interpret a statute, then there's nothing that the court can do. Now, this article continues. I want to give it the clicks. It's well-written. It talks about Brand X. It talks in specific about net neutrality and the fact that net neutrality involved a new interpretation of what the internet is as between an information service and a telecommunication service that placed it in different buckets under the authorizing statute that the FCC uses. And essentially, Brand X was allowed as the precedential decision that essentially required the court's to say, Chairman Agent Pai, whatever you say about this, we're going to have to listen to as long as it's not crazy because we have to afford this rational basis deference to your opinion. And they've got a paragraph here that says, Brand X tied judges' hands to such an extent that Circuit Judge Patricia Millett upheld FCC Chairman Agent Pai's net neutrality repeal despite calling his claim that broadband isn't telecommunications unhinged from the realities of modern broadband service. In other words, The lower courts have to listen to the decisions made by the upper courts. The Supreme Court had held in Brand X, as we will see, that ultimately, even if an agency changes its mind, the court still has to give that deference. And that, at the end of the day, is what Justice Thomas is really complaining about here. But he's also complaining about Chevron deference in general. Now, before we kind of hit that dissent, because it's very unusual for in a certiorari denial that the justice would come out and dissent to it publicly, show exactly why they think that the actual decision should be discussed, presumably uh, altered in some way at the Supreme Court level. Because it is so unusual, I do think it takes uh, some time to actually look at what was said. But I also want to point out that while the headline here at Ars Technica is too narrow, the headline here at like other places on the political spectrum, like The Hill, Justice Thomas Ruse Missed Opportunity to Curtail Government Power, That's too broad, right? That headline also isn't true. It takes a kind of thought process that says that the judicial branch isn't the government, right? Because what we're talking about is checks and balances. What we're talking about is you've got a statute, you've got an interpretation. Should the executive branch win or should the judicial branch win? That's not a curtailment of government power. That's just a different exertion of government power. And that's something that I think gets lost in a lot of conversations in the United States in particular about what the courts are. The courts want to be seen as separate from politics. That doesn't make them separate from government. That Clarence Thomas here is saying that the judicial branch should not have essentially given all of this authority to the executive branch, which is a notion that you can agree or disagree with without coming to a headline that says he misses an opportunity to curtail government power. He missed an opportunity to have the government power live in the judicial branch rather than in these executive agencies. And that's, hey, that's worth discussing. But let's take a look at the actual dissent. Here it is, Supreme Court of the United States, dissent from Baldwin versus the United States. And we'll see this is actually about, just to give kind of further contours about what Arts Technica's headline was, this is actually about an IRS refund deadline, right? Because when we talk about administrative procedures, it can apply to any kind of agency decision. This dissent talks about a case that has been denied certiorari, which means that the Supreme Court will not change the undercourt's decision that cert or review, or whatever you want to say, because I think all the justices pronounce certiorari differently. I think there's rari, I think there's rari uh, at the end there, uh, that if you deny it, the Supreme Court's not going to take it up, and they're not going to change the decision that otherwise would have led it to the Supreme Court. So it, it lives. And the Supreme Court can only cover so many of the cases that are brought to it. And so four of the justices have to agree. They have to grant cert in order to have that case discussed and decided by the Supreme Court. In this case, it was denied, And Justice Thomas disagrees with that denial. He says, under Chevron deference, which we're going to talk about in just a second, courts generally must adopt an agency's interpretation of an ambiguous statute if that interpretation is, quote unquote, reasonable. Usually the agency interprets the statute before any court has considered the question. But sometimes the agency advances an interpretation after a court has already weighed in. 
In the latter instance, we have held that it follows from Chevron, that overall deference, that a court must abandon its previous interpretation in favor of the agency's new interpretation unless the prior court decision holds that the statute is unambiguous, right? If it's unambiguous, there aren't interpretive kind of questions. If it is ambiguous, which let's face it, most statutes are because not every word is defined and Congress likes to delegate authority to agencies, as we have discussed with respect to COPPA, right? All that we have talked about with operators and COPPA and whether YouTube should apply and all of that meaning lives in the original interpretation of COPPA by the FTC, lives in the amended interpretation in 2013, and lives in what they are proposing to be another amended interpretation now in 2020. That the FTC goes and talks about COPPA or any agency goes and talks about the statute that gives its authority by discussing it, by proposing rules, by promulgating those rules under that authority, and by having discussions about what they mean. And the court will give deference to those interpretations as long as they are reasonable. And also, if they change that interpretation tomorrow, Brand X says we have to listen to the new interpretation. This petition asks us to reconsider Brand X. In 1992, the Ninth Circuit interpreted a deadline for rec- requesting a refund from the Internal Revenue Service. The court interpreted it in 1992. 19 years later, and two months after the petitioners claim to have mailed their paperwork to the IRS, the Treasury Department adopted a different interpretation. So in 1992, you had a court interpretation. Now the IRS, some t- two decades later, comes in and says, ah, no, we're interpreting it differently. When petitioners sued the IRS to recover their refund, The Ninth Circuit followed Brand X, deferred to the agency's new interpretation, and rejected petitioner's claim. The Ninth Circuit, itself having made the decision on how this language should be read in the early 90s, had to take the Treasury Department, had to take the IRS, new interpretation in 2000, whenever, and say, okay, all right, well, I guess that new new interpretation will require us to agree with them. And what Justice Thomas is saying here is, twofold. We're going to talk about Chevron deference. We're going to talk about what it does and why it's a potential problem uh, for checks and balances amongst the U.S. government in general, but that brand X might quote unquote follow from Chevron, but it's another step forward. And that step should be, should, should be wheeled back, right? Two decades of precedent in the Ninth Circuit should not be alterable by a new agency interpretation when they could decide the exact opposite tomorrow. And that that's taking judicial power out of the judicial branch. And that's what he cares about. And yes, Brand X allows for agencies to change their mind, to change their interpretation based on whatever they want, as long as it's rational, and it requires the court to follow them. And yes, that led to net neutrality repeals. Yes, that leads to things like COPPA interpretations that you or I don't like. And yes, that means that it is an uphill battle to get those interpretations overturned because the court has essentially ceded this ground. And ultimately, the way the government works right now, if you're not familiar with it, and you might not be if you haven't followed the COPPA videos that we've done, is that Congress, for the most part, delegates huge amounts of authority to the executive branch. And Chevron deference is one of the reasons for that, right? If Congress puts a definition in its statute, if they are very specific and unambiguous about what they want the statute to do, then the court has full authority to go in and say, hmm, that's not right. We reject this as unconstitutional. And so you have to go back to the drawing board, etc. If you add in a second layer, if as Congress you say, well, we want this broad thing. We want the internet to be safe. We want children's data to be protected. Whatever other statute you might want to discuss on these points, we are going to say some broad stuff. Hey, protect that data. And then we're going to say the FTC is going to promulgate rules under it. Good luck, FTC. And then when the FTC does promulgate those rules, the court says, well, we're going to give a strong amount of deference to that. Even if the court has otherwise had its own precedential decision-making happen two decades earlier. And that's the situation you find yourself in. Although I authored Brand X, this is Justice Thomas admitting that he drafted up that decision that led to Brand X, led to all this stuff that we were discussing. Even though he authored it, it is never too late to surrender former views to a better considered position. Brand X appears to be inconsistent with the Constitution, the Administrative Procedure Act, and traditional tools of statutory interpretation. Because I would revisit Brand X, I respectfully dissent from the denial of certiorari. In other words, because Brand X appears to violate the Constitution, another statute, the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, 
and how judges generally interpret statutes, I would change what I decided back in 2005. And hey, you don't have to like Justice Thomas. I have a great deal of issue with a number of his decisions, but I do have to say this. I think society in general would be better off if we were constantly reevaluating our positions and being willing to admit that we were wrong on certain things in the future. I think social media, I think Twitter, I think Facebook, I think all this interaction that we have with each other is great, but it tends to lock us into positions, if only because we don't like to have to answer the question of, hey, you said the opposite 10 years ago on your Twitter feed. And that becomes a problem for people. And I think that locks people in to consistently intractable positions that maybe don't even make sense to your own belief system after a point in time. We should all be growing constantly, all the time. And regardless of whether you think he was right then, he is right now, that he shouldn't be doing this, I do think you have to respect a certain willingness to go public and say, I got that decision wrong 15 years ago. I'd like to change it. My skepticism of Brand X begins at its foundation, Chevron deference. In 1984, a bare quorum of six justices decided Chevron. The court reasoned that if a statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, the question for the court is whether the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. The decision rests on the fiction that silent or ambiguous statutes are an implicit delegation from Congress to agencies. Chevron is in serious tension with the Constitution, the APA, and over 100 years of judicial decisions. Now, I pulled up a kind of short form version of Chevron deference. I will tell you, this is very short form, and it is going to lack some of the nuance that you might otherwise get in law school or having a long form discussion with uh, a lawyer on your own Chevron deference facing issues because hey, there's an entire APA class you can take, a full semester that I took 15 some odd years ago or more at this point. I'd have to look at the year that I took it. But suffice it to say, Chevron deference is described pretty succinctly here. It says, such judicial deference is appropriate where the agency's answer was not unreasonable so long as Congress had not spoken directly to the precise issue at question. The scope of the Chevron deference doctrine is that when a legislative legislative delegation to an administrative agency on a particular issue or question is not explicit, but rather implicit, a court may not substitute its own interpretation of the statute for a reasonable interpretation made by the administrative agency. Generally, to be accorded Chevron deference, the agency's interpretation of an ambiguous statute must be permissible, which the court has defined to mean rational or reasonable. Now, in terms of the law, for the most part, there are different standards of quote unquote scrutiny that the court can apply to the way it interprets a law, generally in respect of constitutional questions. And those levels of scrutiny are rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. If you are receiving strict scrutiny as a law by the Supreme Court, chances are it's going to be overturned because you have to have a compelling state interest. You have to be really, really important. You have to be narrowly tailored to whatever it is you're trying to achieve, all this stuff. Intermediate scrutiny, as you can tell by the title, is a little bit less than that. Rational basis is wildly less than that. As is the case here, as we are discussing with Chevron deference and Brand X, the baseline for how this is interpreted is if you can posit a reason, if you can make up a story that at least sounds reasonable, isn't crazy, then the court is going to afford it deference when when your interpretation of the statute is offered to it. As he says, Chevron compels judges to abdicate the judicial power without constitutional sanction. The vesting clause of Article 3 gives the judicial power of the United States to one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. As I have previously explained, the judicial power as originally understood requires a court to exercise its independent judgment in interpreting and expounding upon the laws. The framers anticipated that legal text would sometimes be ambiguous, and they understood the judicial power to include the power to resolve these ambiguities over time in judicial proceedings. The court's decision in Chevron, however, precludes judges from exercising that judgment. Chevron also gives federal agencies unconstitutional power, as executive agencies enjoy only the executive power. But when they receive Chevron deference, they arguably exercise the judicial power of the United States, which is vested in the courts. Honestly, I would also argue that they probably are exercising the legislative power, right? We've discussed that in our COPPA videos. When you talk about an executive agency promulgating rules that aren't otherwise given a lot of contour in the statute that's authorizing them, yes, Congress has delegated that authority to the executive, but they are engaging in a legislative act. 
as you well know, if you are a YouTube operator and you've been trying to deal with COPPA and following it in through all of its various iterations and various twists and turns, <clears throat> COPPA is something that is interpreted by an agency that is not necessarily locked into what the statute originally purported it to be. Operators were never aimed at YouTube. Now they are. And that's the FTC saying that their interpretation should be given deference. So we've got that situation where Chevron deference does give that authority to the agencies of the executive. You don't have to agree with Justice Thomas here that that's a bad thing. But I do think his general argument here that that's a lot of authority granted to these executive agencies is worth kind of exploring. That do we want those executive agencies, which, by the way, are generally operated by unelected officials. Uh, yes, generally at the highest levels, at the consent of the Senate, but often at its lowest levels, the per people that are actually promulgating these rules, putting out these drafts at a level that is unelected, then do we have an issue with how they operate? Do we have an issue with Congress delegating so much authority? Which isn't to say that Justice Thomas is entirely right, right? The judicial branch is unelected as well. So we always have to ask these questions and nothing is easy when you're talking about the organization of government in this fashion. This apparent abdication by the judiciary and usurpation by the executive is not a harmless transfer of power. The Constitution carefully imposes structural constraints on all three branches, and the exercise of power free of those accompanying restraints subverts the design of the Constitution's ratifiers. The Constitution shielded judges from both the external threats of politics and the internal threat of human will by providing tenure and salary protections during good behavior and by insulating judges from the process of writing the laws they are asked to interpret. In other words, the judiciary has a different mechanism for trying to make sure it operates correctly, that that's how Supreme Court justices have lifetime tenure. That's how you have to actually impeach federal judges and things along those lines in order to get them out of there if they aren't under good behavior rather than have consistent elections and making sure that they are responding directly to the will of the people because it was thought by the framers that the judiciary should have this kind of isolation like tenure for a professor at a university that they should be isolated from that mercurial will that populist tendency and in justice thomas's mind here that is somewhat uh problematically used by the agencies under Chevron deference because they don't have any of those kinds of powers. They don't have any of that kind of constitutional backing. There's no impeachment necessary for those kinds of agencies that might relate to their uh, exertion of the powers that are afforded to them under this deferential review. The Constitution also restricted the legislative power by dividing it between two houses that check each other, one of which was kept close to the people through biennial elections. When the executive exercises judicial or legislative power, however, it does so largely free of these safeguards. The executive is not insulated from external threats, and it is by definition an agent of will and not of judgment. The executive also faces election less frequently than do members of the House, and its power is vested in a single person. Perhaps worst of all, Chevron deference undermines the ability of the judiciary to perform its checking function on the other branches. The founders expected that the federal government's powers would remain separated, and the people's liberty secure only if the branches could check each other. The judiciary's checking power is its authority to apply the law in cases or controversies properly before it. When the executive is free to dictate the outcome of cases through erroneous interpretations, the courts cannot check the executive by applying the correct interpretation of the law. Now, this is an assertion of judiciary authority, right? As you can probably guess at, when you've got a difference of opinion between the executive branch and the judicial branch, you've got an issue of constitutional muster, right? Chief uh, or, or Justice Thomas here is trying to suggest that the judicial should win that fight. But the fact remains that one side or the other has to win it in order to uh, the government to operate. And so Chevron deference basically just says the executive should win those cases. And Justice Thomas disagrees. So this isn't a slam dunk. He isn't saying that, oh, the government should be reduced like the Hill would have you say. He isn't aiming this at net neutrality or anything specific like that. He's saying that in these specific cases, for Chevron deference, that's all deference, then the judiciary should win, that their interpretation should overrule because that was always the authority of the courts. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that breadth, but that is what he's asserting here. This is his first argument, right? This doesn't address brand X, which is the extension of Chevron. He says he wants to go back to foundational principles and say Chevron itself is wrong. And so that I think is probably a harder pill to swallow for the rest 
of the court than just his brand X assertion. But either way, cert was denied. This case is not going to be ruled on. So all of this is essentially just trying to put out there that he would change his stripes. He would not write brand X the same way. Now it's worth noting Brand X was a 6-3 decision, so even if he had flipped sides, it would have been 5-4. He wouldn't have been the author. It wasn't solely his decision-making that got you to Brand X and the extension of Chevron that we saw through it, but it's clear now that he regrets having been a part of that 6-3 decision in the first instance. Chevron is also inappropriate, he says, is a violation of the APA, which is a statute rather than a constitution, which essentially says that the statute should require the judges to decide on these things, and Chevron deference hurts that. We then get a long history lesson from Justice Thomas. He likes to give history lessons. In his decisions, we're going to skip most of this, but he says essentially that the history of the government, the history of these various decision-making policies and practices of the courts should indicate that Chevron should go away as well. He then continues with his second part, the part that actually was discussed in the articles that we just saw earlier in the video. Even if Chevron deference were sound, let's assume that I had no problems with Chevron. I have become increasingly convinced that Brand X was still wrongly decided because it is even more inconsistent than everything I've already said about Chevron. I said, all right, on a foundational principle level, Chevron is wrong. And if I go back to Brand X, I probably should have been on the other side Not because I would have aligned with those particular people that were on the minority position with respect to Brand X, but because I think now Chevron is wrong in and of itself. And by trying to apply a version of stare decisis and expanding on Chevron, that was wrong. But even if we assume Chevron was right, I still think Brand X was wrong. By requiring courts to overrule their own precedent, simply because an agency later adopts a different interpretation of a statute, Brand X likely conflicts with the Article 3 powers of the Constitution, right? What we just talked about, that the judiciary should have the power to look at the law. The Constitution imposes a duty on judges to exercise the judicial power. That power is to be exercised for the purpose of giving effect to the will of the, of the legislature, or in other words, to the will of the law. But Brand X directly directs courts to give effect to the will of the executive by depriving judges of the ability to follow their own precedent. This rule raises grave Article Three concerns, no less than if it allowed judges to substitute their policy preferences for the original meaning of a statute. So said another way, right? Brand X comes in here and tells the Ninth Circuit, you interpreted that for two decades, and now we've decided that's wrong. You have to interpret your own laws, your own precedent, not with stare decisis, but now through this own lens, this own view that we have of the statute. And Justice Thomas says that's wrong. And here, I'm inclined to say there's a much stronger argument, right? That if the court actually wound up deciding on something, then the agency coming in later and changing its mind or maybe reinterpreting or clarifying its previous interpretations, that shouldn't necessarily control the courts. And yes, I think that actually kind of retroactively makes Chevron deference a question in and of itself. Should there be any deference at all? But I do agree that... In this polarized atmosphere, when you've got Obama administration leading into the Trump administration, leading into whatever comes next, you are going to have these wildly different approaches at the agency level. You have a lot of authority that Congress has delegated to these agencies. And I don't think it is a recipe for a smooth transition of that power or a smooth transition of society to simply have whatever agency head happens to hold that seat reinterpret the statute and require all of the courts across the land to follow that interpretation. Rational basis is a very, very easy threshold to meet. And I think Justice Thomas makes a good point here by saying, maybe that's not right, especially if you've already got a decision on the books. Maybe that's not right. The Article Three duty to decide cases, even when the executive disagrees with the conclusion, has long been recognized by this court. In a statutory interpretation case in 1841, the court acknowledged the uniform construction given to the act ever since its passage by the Treasury Department, but stated that if it is not in conformity to the true intendment and provisions of the law, it cannot be permitted to conclude the judgment of a court of justice. It is not to be forgotten that ours is a government of laws and not of men, and that the judicial department has imposed upon it by the Constitution the solemn duty to interpret the laws in the last resort. And however disagreeable that duty may be in cases where its own judgment 
shall differ from that of other high functionaries. It is not at liberty to surrender or to waive it, right? That the court is in charge of deciding the law. And to the extent that you defer to an agency, to the executive, you have perhaps under constitutional requirements, unlawfully delegated that authority to another branch of the government. That's the argument here. And I think it's an interesting one. I don't think it's a slam dunk, as I've said, but it is an interesting one. Brand X is in serious tension with this understanding because Brand X takes on the constitutional deficiencies of Chevron, which I just discussed, and exacerbates them. Chevron requires judges to surrender their independent judgment to the will of the executive, but Brand X forces them to do so despite a controlling precedent. Chevron transfers power to agencies. Brand X gives agencies the power to effectively overrule judicial precedent. Chevron withdraws a crucial check on the executive from the separation of powers, and Brand X gives the executive the ability to neutralize a previously exercised check by the judiciary. But with this said, there is no need to question Chevron in order to recognize the heightened constitutional harms wrought by Brand X. Brand X also seems to be strongly at odds with traditional tools of statutory interpretation. Now, this is a fairly weak claim, but he's basically saying in general, the courts have used certain things in the past to interpret various statutes and Chevron and Brand X come in there and upend that order. Regrettably, Brand X has taken this court to the precipice of administrative absolutism. Under its rule of deference, agencies are free to invent new purported interpretations of statutes and then require courts to reject their own prior interpretations. Brand X may well follow from Chevron, but in so doing, it poignantly lays bare the flaws of our entire executive deference jurisprudence. Even if the court is not willing to question Chevron itself, at the very least, we should consider taking a step away from the abyss by revisiting Brand X, which is pretty flowery language, right? That's pretty strong from a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States issuing a public dissent to the denial of certiorari and getting articles like this written in Ars Technica. So it's definitely worth reporting on. I think it's worth doing a virtual legality on. In terms of the operational legal effect of that, it is none. Brand X survives. Chevron deference survives. This is one justice out of nine saying that he would change things in the future. Now that performs an important signaling function, right? It tells people that want to challenge the current deferential system, that maybe want to challenge Chevron deference, that Clarence Thomas is definitely on board with that concept right now. And that's an important signaling function for those that might want to bring that approach. But you don't know what the other eight are thinking, and you never do until you have the discussion, until the case or controversy is brought before them. But I do think it's interesting, right? I do think it's interesting that you can have a dissent like this that is specifically aimed at what we might consider a more uh, liberal understanding at Ars Technica that says, hey, he would have changed the decision that allowed the FCC to kill net neutrality. And then you have something in the Hill which reads it entirely the opposite way that says, hey, he's upset that he missed the opportunity to curtail government power. And that's always a good sign that neither of those headlines are right, but that it is a discussion that can have wide reaching impact. Chevron deference The deference of the judicial branch to the executive agency's interpretation of ambiguous statutes is the premise on which the current United States administrative state is based, right? So upending it has to kind of take that into account, that if you end Chevron deference, that's going to change a lot of the way Congress writes its laws. That's going to change a lot of the way the agencies actually operate and function. And it's going to require a lot more out of Congress and the legislative to actually define things. Now, personally, I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of the elected officials actually having to define what they intend to do, not kicking all of those questions over to the executive branch and actually having to answer to the judicial branch on what it is the law purports to do. I think that's a closer regime to what was originally intended in the Constitution and by the founders and all that good stuff. But We have to acknowledge that that's not the way current things are. That's not the way the administrative state functions in the United States. And so it is no surprise to me that the other justices say, oh, Justice Thomas, that's going too far. We can't upend this deferential approach, but we appreciate your dissent and we'll catch you on the golf course or whatever it is that they do when they're not making dissents and otherwise interpreting these cases. So I think at the end of the day, this headline is somewhat accurate. The Hills is somewhat accurate, but you have to decide whether or not you want the Congress, the legislative branch, 
to have to make the rules themselves, whether you're comfortable with folks like the FTC interpreting things like COPPA and enforcing them in various ways. And then at the end of the day, if you're comfortable with not having the ability to seek redress from the court system because their primary rule, their statutory interpretation of what the FTC decided to do or the FCC or the IRS or anybody else that you might think of is that they will be deferential as long as there is some purported rational basis that that agency can give for the interpretation that they are offering. In my opinion, that puts people like YouTube creators, IRS refund seekers and others in a very tenuous position, especially if they don't like the president during that particular administration and those rules are being changed willy-nilly in a fashion that maybe might be rational, which isn't a hard threshold to clear, but isn't very useful to the functioning of society. And maybe, just maybe, we'd get a legislation, a legislative branch that operates a little bit more honestly and actually has to put in black and white and down on paper, what it is they intend to make illegal and what it is they intend for people to do or not do under the law. This has been Virtual Legality for today. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a little bit unusual for us to cover these things quite as in depth. We like to take things like Ars Technica articles and video games and pop culture and talk about them in a way that hopefully illuminates and educates through a lens of what you're otherwise interested in. But this is more technical than we usually do. Ordinarily, we're talking about video games, movies, Sony, Disney, all these kinds of fun things in virtual legality. So please do tell your friends, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Hit bells, whatever it is YouTube's having you do nowadays. If you caught it on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Thank you.